You're listening to Kill Cliff's Hazard Ground Podcast with service members from across the military sharing their stories of combat and survival. And now, here's your host, Mark Zeno. Welcome into the Hazard Ground Podcast. As always, we appreciate you joining us each and every week. Before we get to this week's guests, yes, two of them, a pair of authors who have a new book out, an incredible series. We'll get to them coming up in a moment, but just a few reminders, as always, to follow us on all the social media sites, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Hazard Ground and Hazard Ground Podcast as well. Keep those Apple reviews coming. We are inching ever so close to getting to be one of the top 100 Apple podcasts. And we can only do that with your help. So wherever you get your Apple podcasts on your smartphone, on your PC, please go leave us a short review. Give us five stars. Tell us why you love the show. It doesn't have to be anything lengthy. You can do it right from your smartphone, as I said. And uh, we certainly appreciate all of them. And we like to feature some of those reviews from time to time on social media. So a way to say thank you for you guys for helping us out and helping us grow this show. As well, don't forget about our promotion with Amazon. You can go to our website, hazardground.com, click on the Amazon button at the bottom of the homepage or under the sponsors tab, you get to do all of your normal Amazon shopping. We'll get a percentage of whatever you guys spend. And then we'll donate a percentage of that back to some of the great charities you've heard featured here on the hazard ground. Also something you can do from your smartphone, it takes you right to the Amazon app. So if you have all your credit card information saved, really user-friendly, really easy to do and a great way to help help out veterans all across America just by doing some Amazon shopping. On to this week's guest, both of them former Navy men. One of them after five years in the Navy left as the rank of Lieutenant. Another one after 14 years in the Navy who was a trauma surgeon there and part of a SEAL team left the Navy to go on to other careers, including writing a best one tier one, a best selling tier one book series and their latest book called Sons of Valor just came out this past June it is navy veterans Brian Andrews and Jeffrey Wilson joining us here on the hazard ground Brian Jeffrey thank you so much for joining us gentlemen great to be here man thanks for having us yeah so so happy to be here all right uh so both of you guys coming from the navy and and just so the background or everybody understands the whole book series, um, you know, it is is a multiple of, of books here that, that are coming together. Just the latest one that came out, Sons of Valor. Just real quick, give everybody sort of the background on the book series itself. Yeah, sure. Sons of Valor is actually sort of a spinoff series from our Tier 1 series. There's six books out in that series. That was sort of where we broke into a, a high level of success in, in uh, storytelling. And um, Sons of Valor is the first book in a new series that shares that same universe. The main character, uh, Chunk Redman in that, uh, was a minor character in our tier one series. And we got so much uh, fan mail about him. They loved him. Uh, so when we had the opportunity to spin off this other series, we decided who better to head up the new tier one SEAL team than Chunk Redman, since everybody seemed to love him. So uh, that's the first book in this series, but they both series continue to march on. Uh, tier one will have its next installment, book seven next year and uh, next summer the second Sons of Valor book will come out. So we always got a lot going on. Yeah, we can relate. I, I get a ton of fan mail at the Hazard Ground, except sort of the exact opposite. So uh, <laughs> we have that in common. Uh, anyway, so let's start back at the beginning. Um, now, were you guys serving concurrently um, when you when you first started? Did you meet that way through the Navy? No, we didn't meet through the Navy. Um, we were serving in different communities. So I was in the submarine community. I was a submarine officer on a fast attack submarine and Jeff is a combat surgeon, so we're very different communities, but doing, uh, you know, sort of interesting um, analogous type of missions in the sense that we're both on the, you know, what you might call the pointy tip of the spear um, out there in denied areas, collecting intelligence and, and doing other types of stuff like that. But we didn't meet until, uh, you know, post-Navy careers when we were both pursuing interest as authors. We were writing independently, um, writing our own stuff, and we met at a, at a, at a writer's conference in New York City which is a, a great uh, community of authors called Thriller Fest, the international thriller writers community. And um, they have this, this really, really big gathering every summer in New York City. And uh, we, we hit it off, became fast friends and, and started collaborating after that. Well, Brian, for you, let's start with the beginning of your career and how and why you got in the Navy. Yeah, so I uh, was an ROTC scholarship guy. And I want to tout that program for, for all of you out there who are listening, maybe thinking about how am I going to pay for college? It's getting so expensive these days, right? 
And there's this fantastic program, ROTC scholarship, where you know each each of the branches of the service have their own programs. I was Navy, so if you win the scholarship, um, you go to the university of your choice, and they pay for your college tuition. Uh, in exchange, you pay back uh, with service. And I think this is a great model uh, for a couple of reasons. Number one, uh, when you graduate from college, you have zero debt. So instead of being saddled with this massive burden of debt that you're going to be paying down for the rest of your life with student loans, you, you graduate debt free from, from universities. That's fantastic. Uh, number two, um, you're given a, a commission in, in the Navy, in my case, or Air Force or Army or Marines. And you, right at 22 years old, you're stepping into the military with an incredible amount of responsibility. I mean, here I was, you know, uh, 23 year old, and I'm, they're letting me drive around a six and a half billion dollar submarine. I mean, what other, what other place in the world can you be given that sort of opportunity at such a young age? And, uh, and then the last thing is, you know, these leadership skills, the ability to, to uh, when you're put in that position of responsibility, not just, um, from a you know technical standpoint, but also from a leadership and management standpoint, when you if you decide not to make the military your career, when you come out after five years of service, I had more management and leadership training than many of my peers would have you know for the next ten to fifteen years, um, having the the folks that were working for me in the situations that I was in. So it really really is a great program, and and I, I just want to encourage folks to pursue those ROTC scholarships uh, if you can. I am a product of ROTC, uh, so I can echo those same same thoughts. It is always a little bit curious when you get older and look back on life um, that the military and the government decide to give a 21-year-old drunk college kid all the responsibility in the world of equipment and everything else that could only go badly. Um, you know, but again, we, we digress. Uh, it, it is an awesome responsibility. I mean, it really, I, I say that tongue in cheek and I joke around, but you know, Great. myself and, and and my producer, Matt, you know, we, we were lieutenants together and uh, we were on active duty together. And it, it, it is when we think back to some of the dumb stuff we did as 22 year old kids and they're like, yeah, but here, here are all these people, all this equipment in these lives and please go care for them. So, um, you know, better heads take over. Right. I mean, right. And, and that responsibility is, is actually something at that age that as much as dumb things can happen, it keeps you on the straight and narrow. Like it really does. It gives you a sense of purpose. Uh, and anybody worth their salt as an individual doesn't take that responsibility lightly, uh, especially now in, in, in the global war and terror scenario where, you know, lives literally are on the line. Yeah. And I think that the military, you know, this is a program that's been around. It's been stress tested for a long, long time. And the military doesn't suffer fools. So, you know, you quickly either rise to the challenge or, or you're sort of, you know, ushered out the door. And, um, and I think, most of us, you know, that um, look back fondly on our military careers can can proudly say that we rose to the challenge and we met those obstacles and we became better versions of ourselves because we were put in situations that tested us both, you know, emotionally, but also, you know, our, our maturation. And uh, if you don't perform, if you don't become a leader, if you don't um, find your courage and and your self-assurance, then you're, you're, you're just not going to make it. Now, Brian, when did you actually commission? Uh, 96. Okay. So you were pre 9-11 like yeah. I was, which is a, is a whole different world and a whole different time. Um, you know, again, and I, I, I joke around that, you know, when I was commissioned and going through ROTC in college um, and it was my senior year uh, and everybody's going to job fairs and people would ask me, are you going to the job fair? And I'm like, no. And they're like, why? And I'm like, cause I have to go in the army after college. I'm in ROTC. And they're like, why don't you get a real job? Yeah. Well, okay. So <laughs> Life life worked out uh, different as we all as we all know. So, uh, Jeff, what about you? When did when did you start your Navy career? So mine is a mine is a little bit of a roller coaster story uh, for my naval service. Um, I initially uh, went into the Navy to become a, a pilot. I come from an aviation family and uh, wanted to follow in my dad's footsteps. So I I started down that path and uh, way back in 1986 as a as a uh, 22 year old and. Um, was in a motorcycle accident that cut that short. And so I left, uh, left the Navy. And at that time went and worked in uh, other parts of the federal government for a period of time, um, doing some things that looked exciting on television and on paper uh, were not as exciting in real life. I and mean, they were exciting, but uh, you know, the violence is not 
all it's cracked up to be if all you know about it is watching TV, right? So uh, I left that and uh, I joined the Naval Reserves after I went to medical school. I decided I wanted to go uh, be a physician. Um, I had a, quite a bit of flying experience. I flew corporate jets and stuff like that and just went a different direction looking for a life of peace. So I went to med school, but because I have this uh, almost pathologic need to serve as it does everyone in my family. I continued as a reservist with the goal, hey, you know what, I'll, I'll, be, a, I'll be an academic surgeon in the civilian world and a reservist and still serve my country. So I was in uh, surgical training, finishing up actually, or close to done when uh, those crazy jackasses crashed planes into the towers in the Pentagon and field in Pennsylvania. And uh, like so many people, you know, that we know, it just pissed me off. So um, I got in touch with the reserve detailer and told him I want to go on active duty. He said he's going to get me mobilized. I said, no, you don't understand. I want to transition all the way to active duty permanently. And so I was able to work that out, uh, finished up my training and deployed with um, the Marines with a second MEF as part of a uh, FRIS team, um, the little surgical teams that follow along to the edge of the battlefield and provide surgical support. And while I was downrange, I actually ran into some folks from my weird spooky past. We uh, conducted an operation supporting them. And uh, when I got home there, they, they got back in touch with me and said, Hey man, we got something you got to do. You really like that. You'd be perfect for this. And um, long story short, I went through a bizarre screening process that began in a bar in Virginia beach and <laughs> eventually ended up with a, uh, with an East coast based seal team um, developing a, little small footprint package to provide direct action surgical support with just a couple of people, you know, in denied areas, austere areas and stuff like that. And so then I spent the vast majority of my time in the Navy doing that and um, also supporting a joint counter terror task force afterwards. So that sounds weird, uh, weird okay, story. as they say, what's that? That sounds elite as they say. I don't you know. I guess. Yes. Elite. I, the, the unit was elite. I don't know that I ever was, but uh, it was it was pretty cool stuff. Obviously, uh, made some brothers in that community that uh, will always mean the world to me. I've unfortunately lost a lot of them. But um, yeah, it was an incredible experience. Definitely changed the trajectory of my life. You know, we talk about everyone can tell how 9-11 completely changed their life. You know, I went from I'm going to go be an academic professor of vascular surgery at some university somewhere and that never that never realized itself um after my military career my passion for that was sort of gone uh after that decade and uh, but by then i was writing books and had met brian and uh my books were doing okay but when we started writing together the, our books did fantastic and so i went off on that career path instead brian where were you on 9 11 yeah so i had actually um separated from the Navy in June of that year. And I was oh, wow. in business school. Yeah. So I was in business school. I remember um, sitting in a, you know, was a, my wife and I were studying, actually, she was a business school student at the same time we were studying and, and the emails came out, uh, you know, at the school on the, on the, you know, student circuit, you know, everybody turn on the TV. Now you guys got to see what's happening in New York. And I happened to be at Cornell. So there was a lot of uh, folks because it's in New York. There were a lot of folks who had uh, either, you know, relatives or uh, professional associate, you know, colleagues or associates that were in the towers at the time. So it hit pretty hard. Yeah. So with uh, with your career being done at that point in time, um, did you have any desire sort of to reverse course like like Jeff did? You know, the thought did cross my mind and, and I wrestled with that throughout the year. Um, I think for me, what I decided at the time was that, you know, I was there on a leadership, uh, park leadership fellow program representing the armed forces, really. I, I looked at my role in that program as, hey, I'm one of the few handful of naval officers that's ever been in this program. And, and I have a role to play, which is to, you know, bring my experience and everything that I represent from my Naval service into the program. And as a submarine officer, you know, that's not a community that you just simply um, sort of jump back into, so to speak. Does that make sense? Like uh, the, the ships are on very rigid rotations and it's not like I could have called up the detailer and said, hey, stick me back on a boat. I wanna be in the front lines. Um, 
So I don't know how that would have worked out. Maybe I could have done that, but that wasn't the path that I chose at the time. Um, Jeff, I'd like to go back to you for a minute. Uh, when you know 9-11 kicks off and you are end up, you know, obviously you start with the Marines, but when you get to the SEAL community, your deployments obviously are ramping up at a high level. Um, so kind of what are we talking about? How many deployments did you have over the course of the remaining part of your Navy career? Yeah, you know, it's a strange, it's a strange community. And the, uh, the unit I was with is a little bit stranger still. So the, the deployment cycle is sort of continuous. And, um, you know, you're sitting these 0300 packages at one time, and then you're downrange another time. So it sort of it sounds like I'm being vague, but it sort of depends on how you define a deployment, right? I mean, this was a unit that would go off and do some very short fuse, short timeline things. Uh, so if you look at all the times I traveled, it's probably a half a dozen. If you look at, if you define it as being in theater more than 30 days, it's only a couple. Um, and then when I when I left that particular unit and went into a broader community, then it's even more more blurry. So over that over that 10 years, I was in uh, I was in Iraq a couple of times. I was in Afghanistan a couple of times, and I was in a couple other areas of that region of the world two or three times beyond that. I'm always fascinated when we talk to combat medics, surgeons, whoever it may be, and we get them on the podcast often. Um, their stories to me are always, you know, some of the some of the most difficult ones to tell um, because literally, I mean, they, they see battle up close more routinely than anybody who actually is in combat, right? Like all of us, you know, we've gone out on missions, we've gone outside the wire and you see combat, bad things happen. You know, you go out, you do it again. But there's, there's generally a finite number when you are in that community, um, saving lives is a almost seven day a week job. So from that standpoint, um, I know you talked about guys that you lost, but um, operational tempo, like how often are, are, is someone laying in front of you with their life in their hands? Yeah. So it, it's interesting from a medical standpoint. Um, I think that my deployment with the Marines was a little bit more of that. Obviously you'd have long right. stretches of, of boredom and then um, and then you'd have a lot of, a lot of casualties. I saw a lot more, uh, surgical things during that. And I saw some horrible things, uh, during that time I was in, uh, I was in Fallujah when, um, operation dagger was going on. And so we saw some casualties from that out at the forward edge of the battlefield. When I was out in, um, Western Anbar near Rutba, we were at Korean village was sort of our garrison, if you will. We would get spurts of, you know, activity along that highway uh, running out to the west towards the Syrian border. So you'd have like a week where you'd be busy and then not. Uh, and then I also um, went back to uh, Camp Fallujah on my way out and was supporting an operation. After, after I had supported that operation, I was going to travel again and I got stuck at Camp Fallujah. Uh, because there was no air. And so I, by coincidence, happened to be there. I don't know if you remember in 2005, there was this horrible ambush. I was there. Convoy. Were you there? I so was in Baghdad had... at the time. Yeah, I was, I mean, it was actually uh, attached to a special operations unit in 05 at the time. And uh, there was a lot of consternation about us quickly moving into Fallujah to rectify the, the situation after the fact. Yeah. So I was there um, when it happened and, uh, for those that aren't familiar with it, there were um, there were women from the Marine unit that were assigned to these uh, checkpoints. There was a all volunteer thing, um, and they would travel out to checkpoints as a truly as doing the right thing, a courtesy. So because of the culture, men frisking women was not acceptable, and so these women volunteered for this dangerous job, and they targeted uh, the shitheads targeted that convoy. They sort of got a rhythm for what they were doing. They attacked it with some incendiary IEDs, resulting in a massive explosion and fireball uh, that killed a couple, a bunch of people, but set a lot of other people on fire, a lot of young girls on fire. And then the snipers started popping people there. So I happened to be there when I heard what was coming in. I, I ran over, it was not my unit or my team, but I offered to help. And so I was there when they brought in all these horribly burned young ladies and um, Marines that had been shot and burned. And it, that, so I don't know why, how I went down this bunny hole, but that, like, if I think of traumatic things that I saw during my service that night, probably 
ways against everything else combined. It was absolutely horrible. I can remember uh, talking to those women, uh, the young women that were going out before they went out um, because they were there and, and um, had passed through. But anyway, so from a surgical standpoint, a medical standpoint, that deployment was where I saw the most of the, I guess you'd call horrors of war, right? Mm-hmm. When I was with the, uh, with the JSOC unit, we didn't see a lot because that's a unit that's in and out. And, uh, you know, you go somewhere across a border, you're maybe, you know, not officially recognizing and uh, spending a few days there. The idea was that we were going to support those very small uh, teams with just one or two people and what we could carry on our backs. And so that was where I saw more combat operations, um, but a lot less medical stuff. And um, I would say the handful of medical things I saw, the vast majority of it was either relatively minor um, in terms of, you know, the horrors of it for our guys, or it was the bad guys, which wasn't as emotionally taxing as you can imagine. Sure. Um, so a lot less of that kind of stuff uh, during my deployments um, with the, with the team. So. I mean, how much of that uh, still stays with you from the, the, you know, dealing with trauma patients uh, sort of experience, you know, I mean, it's always uh, every, every doctor will tell you, it's never the ones that they save that they remember. It's the ones that they didn't save that they don't, uh, yeah. that, that ends up sticking with them more than anything. Um, is, is there anything about those experiences that's still kind of carrying with you every day? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you know, there's, when you see what human beings are capable of doing to other human beings, uh, it changes you in ways that are hard to describe, whether you saw it as a, as an army infantry, uh, or as a surgeon, you're still seeing these horrible things and wondering how on earth can a human do this to another, to another human. Um, so yeah, those, those images I definitely carry with me. Um, and then, you know, the loss of teammates you carry with you for different reasons, you know, you know, maybe didn't see the gory stuff or whatever, but, um, you know, those guys are, you become truly, as you know, you become brothers with those people. And uh, so when, when you lose folks, you know, I was already gone from the unit when extortion one seven happened, but I knew a bunch of those guys and that was very difficult, even though I wasn't there in many ways, that was more difficult than some of the things I saw and did. Um, and then there's the issue of, you know, what if I could have been there and I don't know, it's, it's all, it's all, that's for the shrinks to figure out, I guess, but it's, uh, but you know, that, that stuff, definitely you carry it with you. You carry it with you for a long time. Yeah. Um, and, and uh, you know, Brian, as, as all this is unfolding and you get deeper into this, um, I'm just saying, I'll ask the same question again, you know, you, you, the urge to go back in right after 9-11 when you were already out. And then, uh, you know, as things continue to go on, you never once uh, wanted to put, it, put, put the hat back on and, and, and get, into the, get into the mix of everything? Oh, sure. I mean, Of course you think about that. And then you think, like Jeff said, you think about the other, you know, your brothers that have stayed in and what they're doing. And, you know, I think there's pride in service too. I always felt like I was really good at my job. I was good at driving submarines. And um, so, yeah, there's days that you think, did I make mistakes? Should I stayed in? Would I be a better boat skipper than, you know, some of my peers that stayed in and could I be making a difference? And um, yeah, I mean, I think it's human nature to wrestle with those things. Um, but I also think it's okay too to be proud of the service. And, you know, I always tell people, you know, if I had to do it over again, I would think I would make the same decisions that I made, which is, um, you know, I made the decision, the best decision I thought I could make at the time with the information that I had. And I think a lot of us are plagued with, um, you know, this idea of, I don't mean, regrets sort of a, a common word, but it's just, a, I think we torture ourselves with this hindsight, you know, this idea that, well, now that I know what happened, I I should have done X, Y, Z. But I think if we're conscientious and we look at all the information that we have at the time we make our decisions, we shouldn't beat ourselves up for the decisions we made at the time. I think, you know, when the, when, when I was already in school and the towers came down, I don't, in the beginning, people didn't even understand the depth of the situation and what was going on. It took years before this whole thing evolved, um, to what it did. So it's always an evolution. And I think I could have come back and I probably would have been a good boat skipper, but that wasn't the path that I took. 
And again, I got to wonder too, like if I was in that community, you know, I think the desire to, to move back in would have been, uh, I probably would have made the same decision as you, Brian, like, like just because it wasn't that war, right. The war that you had trained for wasn't the war we were in. Right. Like we weren't, we weren't sneaking up on, on anybody in 688 class fast attack boats. Right. I mean, it was so, so you, I would have struggled, I think with the idea of, okay, well, I could go back in. I, I feel this patriotic passion, but what am I contributing? Like what, what would I be doing as a surgeon? I can say, well, I got to patch guys up or, or whatever. Or if you're a, or if you're an operator, or you're a pilot or, you know, something like that. If you're a surface warfare, especially in the submarine community, that must've been part of it. Right. You're like, yeah, well, I mean, I, I can come back in and go float off in the Pacific in a 688 class. Right. <laughs> what the hell, what the hell am I doing for this particular war? Well, and I appreciate that comment. Cause I think that's true. If I really think about it, you know, the odds that my particular boat would have been the one providing like, tomahawk support in the Persian Gulf or something is like 5%. I mean, most likely, like you said, Jeff, we would have continued this, the type of boat that I was on, the type of missions that we did covered a very wide spectrum of activities and, you know, tomahawk support to the ground-based troopers. Like that's just one little piece of um, our mission package. Right. So, and there's, there's probably only one or two boats over there at any given time. The rest of the submarines are out doing all the other sneaky things that submarines do that, nobody's paying attention to so yeah uh Crim crimson tide still one of my favorite flicks that was you i guess right, uh, right yeah sounds the dog no dogs <laughs> on board, but. uh jeff tell me about uh what led you to ultimately leave the military especially after 14 years i mean most people at that point are just staring at the finish line to 20 but you decide to end it yeah so to be honest, it had more to do with being pulled out of the community where I had been serving than anything. Um, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't looking, I knew I had other things I could do. I could go back and be a civilian surgeon. By the time I left, I was already writing and I, I was sort of excited about that career. Had I been able to stay in the community that I was, had been working and serving in for so long, I don't know. I probably would have stayed in indefinitely, um, uh, although that would have been a horrible family decision. The, the, the stress of that, of that community and, and those, that decade on my wife, on my, on my kids, that was a real thing. It was very measurable, but I wasn't measuring it. You know what I mean? Like, and you can, you can relate to this. Sometimes you don't really see those effects until you can step away and then look back at it and you're like, holy crap, look at this hot mess I've got that I'm creating in my backyard but you're so focused on what you're doing that you don't see it. So I'm very glad that it, it happened when it happened. I'm not sure what would have been uh, the future for my family um, had I gone long. That wasn't the reason that I left. I left because they no longer wanted me in that community. They wanted me to go check some boxes and I don't know, run a hospital. I don't know what they wanted me to do. They wanted me to do some medical thing, like be some grown up. <laughs> Kind of what you initially I'm thought you were going to do, right? Like, yeah, so right, right, exactly. <laughs> they wanted me to be an adult doctor. I was like, well, I don't even know. How can I even know how to do that anymore? <laughs> so it, it became a pretty easy decision. You know, six years. Yeah, I could have gotten a, uh, I could have made it to in a retirement that would have represented a rather small percentage of what I make a year right now, uh, writing, writing novels with my best friend, which is a hell of a lot more fun. So um uh, but I get it. Yeah. Every I've never given the number of years of service and had people go 14 years. What are you an idiot? Like you're, you're almost there. Um, but for me, it was really about the job rather than the, you know, career or whatever. Well, apparently you haven't been brainwashed like the rest of us that 20 is the mark that we all need to attain to. Right. I mean, <laughs> uh, you are, you were impervious to that whole, that whole ideology. Um, especially now with, you know, everybody in the military uh, resigning their commission nowadays because it's the grandstanding passe things to do yeah, uh, over things that frankly aren't worth resigning over, but uh, different discussion for a different day. Uh, right. I digress. So uh, we talked about how you guys met earlier. Kind of give me more of the, the background and the details. Uh, you Again, Jeff, you had just left the Navy and, and Brian, you were already in the author realm at that point. Yeah, the author realm was something I sort of um, stuck my toe into. I would, had been doing some entrepreneurial things. I had a, a business, a small business um, that was up and running and doing well. And um, quite frankly, I'm going to be honest with all you aspiring authors out there. 
If you don't have a little war chest of money that you've saved and made from some other occupation, uh, then you're taking a very big risk getting into the writing business because it is a very <laughs> difficult and uh, uh, challenging industry to make a, make a living in. So uh, most writers find that when they start off and they get published, even if you get published with a traditional house, you get an agent, you get published with a traditional house, the money is not rolling in like you think. You know, yeah. you hear these stories about the authors, the one in a million Cinderella story, the, the, the guy or girl that got picked up and their book became a New York Times bestseller and they get a seven figure movie deal. Like, remember, that's like 0.0001% of the rest of the millions of people out there struggling to tell their stories and, and write books. So it is, it is a long slog, just like anything else. A lot of really smart people trying to do it. very competitive, very crowded space. And so just be prepared for an uphill battle. And, and you know, that's why I got involved in this conference. I wanted to hear best practices and learn from other people who had been successful. And that's sort of the military ethos is, hey, let's benchmark off of other people that are doing it right. People that have been doing this for years. Why should I come in thinking, that I'm an expert when I've never participated in this industry at all. So this community of thrill thriller writers really embraces almost a military ethos, very fraternal. Hey, let's help each other. We'll share best practices. We'll help lift you up and get you into the business. And I think Jeff came to that same conclusion independently. And then when we met there, oh man, there was quite a synergy for us. Um, as we became friends, like Jeff said, we started thinking, hey, maybe there's an opportunity to take some of these military principles of teamwork, collaboration, mission before self. What if we put those into a writing brand? And that's what we did. Yeah, I think that's what makes us different is, um, and, it's, and it's what's probably most interesting to your listeners is that our success as writers is because we were, come from a military background. I don't mean just like we know how to write the stuff. Like that's, that's part of it too. There's a lot of that going on now, you know, back in the day when we were kids, those great military thrillers, they were written by people who had never served in the military. And now you've got, you know, Don Bentley out there. You've got Joshua Hood out there. You've got us. You've got uh, Tony Tatas out there. You've got all these people that have real military experience writing in the space. And so it's exciting. But what I'm referring to in the collaborative process with Brian and I is that those lessons you learn, you know, when you're in the military, especially during wartime, that idea of mission before self and team before self those aren't just words anymore. Like that's how you live your every day yep. in order to get jobs done. If you're on a nuclear submarine, if you think you're the dude that's driving the submarine and everybody else is just, you know, minor characters in your play, then you're not going to be very successful. And so we both came from backgrounds in the military where it truly was mission and team before self. And like Brian said, we actually had a conversation over drinks one night in New York, like what that would look like if we were to collaborate. And I will be honest, at first I was against it. I've been writing my whole life and I couldn't imagine how you write together. It just didn't make sense. But the idea of using that team mindset, I found that very, very attractive. And I think that uh, our success now, you know, becoming best-selling authors and selling all these books, that's the reason. It's because we were able to do that, put ego aside have a mission, serve that mission, serve that team, which is the two of us uh, ahead of our personal needs and wants. And I think that's the secret to our success. And that can be applied to any business. You know, after you get out of the military, that's the thing you bring with you the most. You know, you may not be able to find a job as a infantryman or as a helicopter pilot or whatever your military background is, but whatever space you're in, the ability to be a servant leader to be someone who leads from the front with a compassion and a desire to serve his, his people uh, and his mission and his team, that is invaluable everywhere. And I think that when people learn that and understand it, that's when they can be truly successful. For us, it was writing, but it applies to everything. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm just curious about how, at the beginning of the relationship, you know, you're talking- He was a stalker. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I'm curious to know how and why he stalked you, but what, was there any, you, you mentioned a little bit of the resistance, so to speak, but was, uh, I mean, talk me through this sort of the, the beginning foundation of the whole thing, because, you know, as you said, not, not only do you have to sort of like the person you're working with, but you have to have similar sets of ideas of how you want to execute it. So that's not always, you know, that doesn't always start off from the same starting point. Yeah, that's right. 
That's right. And that was the key to our success was that because of our military background, we were able to establish that up front. We were already best friends. We'd, we'd met there. We had been friends for two years, I think, by the time we had the idea to write together. I had written three books. He had two out and another one coming. And we were sort of looking at the next project. And it was Brian that said, hey, you know, you've worked in this community with SEALs and I'm in the sub. What if we did some books that were like these two spaces? And and I liked the idea of it. It was just the creative part of it. I didn't see how it would work. But once we settled that, the thing that made it work the most was exactly what you're talking about, establishing what that's going to look like, right? Having a real conversation. Do you share a business vision? Because it's a business. Do you share you know, a work ethic? Do you have, you know, the same goals for what this is going to be? If one of them, one of us wants to make it a career and the other one wants to make it a hobby, we're going to be in trouble, right? So um, we had a big, long conversation laying out what those goals, what each individual's responsibilities were. And had we not done that, I can't imagine it would have been successful. I just can't imagine. Brian, what about for you? Oh yeah, no, he, he's exactly right. You have to have common goals. I think there has to be, you know, a personality match, you know, just like um, if you're going to be in a long-term partnership, this has to be somebody that you respect, but most importantly, somebody that you trust. Because there's going to be times where you're not micromanaging. I mean, you can't be micromanaging the other person. I mean, uh, let's say I was under the weather today and I had to let Jeff do this podcast without me. I'd have to feel very confident he's going to represent not only his story, but my story and our brand and, 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 and deliver our message without me having to even blink an eye about it. Same thing with business decisions. What if I'm sick and he's got to negotiate a contract? I have to know that he's looking out for my best interest. So, you know, anytime that you're involved in a business with somebody, that absolute trust is very important. And I also think that, you know, the secondary thing is, you know, we all are high achievers, you know, especially, um, folks that whatever business you're in, if you reach a certain level of success, you're confident in your abilities. And, you know, there's a certain level of, of ego that comes along with that. Hey, I made it. I know how to do X, Y, Z. I used to drive a submarine for God's sake, or I used to lead, you know, from the pointy tip of the spear with a bunch of seals. Like you've, you have some great accomplishments under your belt, but when you're in a business, when you're in a partnership, you have to find a way to check that ego and put that ego aside and that can be challenging for a lot of people. And one of the things when we first started, Jeff said is, I think for this to work, you know, as we're two authors and we each have our own way of telling stories, if this is going to work, we have to be able to put our ego aside and say, hey, we're going to focus on this book. And this book is what matters, not, you know, you wrote this page and I came up with that idea, this, that, and the other. So that's really the way that we approach it. And over the years, uh, you know, it's come to really personify our brand, which is when somebody picks up one of our books and they turn to page, you know, 137, they're not going to be able to tell a difference between that page and 20 pages later. It's not going to be like jarring because, oh, this feels like one guy telling a story and this, this part feels like somebody else. And the reason why that is, is because we both have given the other author free reign to edit and change and do whatever he feels is necessary to make the story better. And you end up with one seamless voice throughout the book, but you wouldn't have that if it wasn't for the trust and putting the ego aside as we write the story. So essentially your relationship is unlike every marriage in history. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> Writing that down. Um, so when you guys get together for the first book, What's it like discussing topic ideas, themes, and things of that nature? I mean, I, I know you guys had wanted to talk. Obviously, you're writing about special operations community, uh, or at least the tier one series is about that, obviously, right? I mean, but how do you, how does the idea of the brainstorming sessions go? Well, I mean, Jeff likes to use this, the analogy, say we're like two eight year olds in the backyard playing army, you know, and, and that's kind of what it's like, you know, and that is the most fun part of the process, I would say, is when we start a new story or a new series or a new book in, in one of the existing series is we sit down and we're like, all right, what if? Every story starts with this what if question, you know? And so Sons of Valor, for example, the, the what if question is, hey, you know what? We've had this asymmetrical battlefield in Afghanistan for 20 years. What if, you know, the Taliban was to acquire 
um, you know, drone technology that suddenly leveled the playing field, put them on the same uh, par as, as us. How would we adapt to that situation? And from that what if story, then the characters have to, you know, adapt and figure out how to deal with the threat. So it's that beginning, that brainstorming phase around that what if question and us going back and forth trying to figure out what is the best what if question, what's, what's the most interesting, how would it engage our characters. That's the genesis of every book. And that's the, that's the really, really fun part. Yeah. Uh, you have my head spinning right now, which leads to my next question. Um, because the Taliban applying, uh, acquiring drone technology, I'm like, well, they can't shoot for shit anyway. Um, so from that standpoint, they're not going to hit whatever they have with a drone if they can't do it with an AK-47. Uh, so that begs the question of you're writing fiction, but how realistic does it have to be, especially for two guys who wore a uniform and understand the realism of combat and what it is. I mean, was that ever a concern in writing? Yeah, I would I would say that we started out from the very beginning with a commitment to each other that we were going to look, it's fiction. We're not going to write about the four weeks that you just go to the KBR and have a, you know, omelet and while you wait for a mission package. That's boring. But in terms of what the story really is, in terms of the action, in terms of most importantly, the characters and the relationships, we wanted that to be very realistic. We wanted it to honor and represent the communities that we had served in so that, you know, if someone from um, my unit read it, they were like, yeah, that's what I would do in that situation. You know what I mean? So yeah, we, we are going to design a what if question that is fiction, but we want it to be possible. So for example, in this story in Sons of Valor, yeah, you're right. The Taliban, they're, you know, living up with, uh, with the goat herders up in the Hindu coast somewhere. They ain't flying no drones. But what if this young next generation of jihadists came along and provided that technology. And so that was part of that what if question in Sons of Valor, right? It's like, we've got people on our side who are deploying now in, the, in what we change the name periodically, but let's call it what it is. It's a war against terrorism. There are people deploying right now somewhere in the world who weren't born on 9-11. This is a second generation of war fighters fighting in the same war. And they're not the same. Our younger warriors are not the same as the guys that were live on, on 9-11. But wouldn't that be true for the bad guys also? And we know this. We know for a fact that the new generation of jihadists they are more, more likely to be multilingual. They're more likely to have education. They're technologically far more savvy. And so that was the premise here is that what if there's this new generation of fighters who are going to allow the Taliban to help them get where they need to go or go into Pakistan and get help from Taliban on that side of the, of the gray border that they have over there? Um, what would that new generation of jihadists look like? And what will the new generation of American warfighters do in response to a suddenly asymmetric battlefield after two decades of controlling the airspace? So you got me. I'm in. I'm hooked. All right. <laughs> and, and let's and let's not forget, you know, over the past 20 years, something else has changed, which is the accessibility to these type of weapon platforms. And we have our friends in China to thank for that. So, you know. At the beginning of, you know, the war on terror 20 years ago, a predator drone, you know, was something that was only in our arsenal. This is a $60 million weapon that's out of the reach due to not only cost, but the way that the defense industrial complex controls who can acquire this technology. But now, you know, you go to uh, online, you can look and see, oh, there's the Chinese uh, pterodactyl wing moon drone. This thing looks remarkably like a, a predator um, and oh, it costs, you know, $5 million. So now suddenly, you know, uh, you have a weapons platform that is being sold to Pakistan that is in the realm of the pocketbooks of a well-funded terrorist organization. So it's impossible for them to get a predator, but it's not impossible for them to get a predator clone. Yeah, and uh, for, the, for the civilians listening who uh, don't find this plausible, just remember, uh, there weren't cell phones in Afghanistan prior to us getting there. So, uh, and for the most part, there weren't in Iraq either. I mean, we brought them there and, and made them 
a viable technology. So yes, the technology on multiple levels is transferable um, from nation to nation from that aspect. So uh, I, I, you got me hooked. It, it, it does make sense. And it's funny because I was just having this conversation um, yesterday with a coworker about, you know, the direction our military is heading in and where we're going um, and, and what it looks like. And while I think we can have legitimate discussions about the changing of the corporate culture of the military, um, the idea that we are going to be any worse 10 or 15 down, 10 or 15 years down the road from a combat power standpoint, I categorically disagree with. Um, sure, our force has to change because nothing 20 years later should be the same. Again, to use marriage, your marriage isn't, 20, isn't the same 20 years later after when you first got married. So nothing from a corporate culture standpoint should be the same, but that does not negate our ability to continually advance and being the world's most premier fighting force in our combat power. And in short, the ability to kick the enemy's ass. I mean, you know, like that's, that is, that, that is never going to be in retrograde. Um, if it is, we have much bigger concerns than uh, any corporate culture, military issues that, that may be out there. Yeah, I agree with that completely. And, and one of the main reasons I agree with it is because we're an all volunteer military. People that are joining the military who are saying, I want to be a Green Beret, I want to be a Ranger, I want to be a fighter pilot or a Marine, they are motivated by something personal. It's, you know, there's a, the occasional sociopath that slides through, I suppose. But in general, right. these people are highly motivated by a desire to serve their families, their communities, and their nation at a very high level. And as culture changes, these people, this select 1% that choose that path, they don't change. The, the technology changes. Yeah, the corporate leadership and, and org charts might change. But in the end, the guy with the rifle is there because he passionately believes he's doing something for God and country. And as long as we have that, I agree with you completely. These, all the other arguments, I get some of them. Some of, some of the stuff I see, it pisses me off too. But do I think it's destroying the military? I don't. I agree with you completely. I think that as long as we have those people and, and they're motivated, we're going to have the greatest military power on earth. It's, it's a little bit overstated because, you know, social media uh, and media in general. But again, different discussion. Um, so you guys collaborate uh, and, and um, much like today, you get together and you have a child um, and your child is your first book. So uh, when that, that thing comes to life, uh, you know, one, what's the feeling um, after this effort? And two, did you have any idea how successful it would be when you finally got your first edition? Well, I mean, it's a great feeling when you put that kid out into the world, right? You, and you don't want anybody to call your baby ugly, right? So, I mean, there is a little, you're a little sensitive. You want those five-star reviews. You want it to resonate with people. And uh, I think one of the reasons that our series do resonate with readers is because we were very intentional from the beginning and saying, you know what, we want to tell the story of these unsung heroes uh, who are risking their lives every day, who are men and women that are defending our country and they're doing it uh, not for fame and fortune, they're doing it because that's the principle that matters to them most. And we also want to do it in a way that for the, you know, for the readers, there's like Jeff said, 1% of Americans have served. So that means 99% of Americans may not be as familiar with the military culture and the types of things that are going on. And we want these stories to be accessible to everyone. So we tried to take an approach where we write a very politically agnostic series we don't get into the politics. What we get into is the, the characters and the, the, the sacrifices that they've made, what's going on in their headspace, and how do they deal with conflict. And these type of human stories are accessible to everybody. And yeah, there's a learning curve, you know, but when you when you join when you show up on a submarine, nobody's holding your hand and taking you around the boat and saying, well, this is what this does, and this is what that does, and micromanaging every minute of your day. You have to figure it out for yourself. And so we kind of give our readers the credit that they can do the same thing. You know, when they when they pick up Sons of Valor, the, the book opens with uh, an infill, a, a, a mission with the seals, and you're right there with them. You know, you're right there fitting in with Chunk and his team, and you feel like you're with the seal team as they board the ship and, and take this vessel. And so we give our readers credit that they're gonna be able to handle that, and they're going to enjoy it. And it turns out they, 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 they do. 
Jeff? Yeah, thank goodness they do because, you know, I've got four children and uh, more and all that. But yeah, no, I think- Four children. Yeah. Four like, like human children. <laughs> I, I like what you said of the, 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 because we've used that before, um, the idea that that's your child, you know, and when you come down to that collaborative thing we were talking about before, that's exactly right. You know, Wendy and I don't divide up the kids like, and I'm in charge of the boys and she's in charge of the girls or more likely I'd be in charge of the ones that are trouble. But, you know, instead it's like our kid. And that's how Brian and I approach these books is this is our kid and we want it to do well. Um, but we wanted to start off with the ethos that we described to you before and how we approach the books. And we didn't know with tier one, we didn't know it was either going to be a big success or everyone's going to go, that's terrible. We're blessed that it was a big success. But I think the reason is what Brian said. It's because people like the stories they, you know, especially right now, they, they consider these people heroes and they want to see what they're really like. They don't want that Superman type superhero character. They want a guy who's got difficulties and flaws and relationships and stuff like that. And that's what we try to write instead of that invincible bulletproof guy that goes in by himself, right? You know, flies the helicopter in, gets out, kills all the bad guys, rescues the girl, flies back. And we don't have any of that. We have team oriented, you know, everybody has their important mission uh, or important job on the mission and the relationships matter. And I think that's why we've been successful. I think that resonates with people. They like to see characters portrayed as they really exist in real world. Yeah, what you just described about the hero thing, essentially the Hurt Locker, which is why it sucked. Uh, right. Discussion for another different day. Um, what's harder, writing your first book and making it a success or your second book, the follow-up book and making it a success? I mean, anybody can make a pretty baby once, making two of them in a row, ain't that easy? <laughs> And that's a different stress, isn't it? You're exactly, you're exactly right. And usually, and readers will, you know, readers will, if they love the first book, they demand a good second book. If you can get yeah. two of them out, they'll give you a pass on one, maybe book three, maybe book four isn't as good. Um, but you better make sure that second book is even better than the first if you want to grow the brand in the series. So there, I, it's funny that you key into stuff like that, man. It's like you've done this, but um that was a real stress. I remember when rodeo, Jeff. I'm 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 good at this. <laughs> I, I remember when we were writing that book. That was a real thing we talked about all the time. It's like, man, we gotta we gotta keep this one tight and sharp. It's gotta be better. It can't be as good. It's gotta be better, or else they're gonna we're gonna have attrition. We're gonna peel off these readers, and we're talking about quitting day jobs here. We gotta meet, keep this moving. It's a real stress. No, it is. And but I assume you know the creative process for it. Um, in a sense, you can make perfect the enemy of good, right? Like, I mean, yes, it's, it's hard to know what readers are going to react to positively and negatively. As you talked about at the top of the show with that one character who people just wanted to see more of, I don't think you ever wrote that character with the intent of we're going to make this guy a bigger, grander character down the road. You You're just right. sort of got that reaction from people and, and went with it. So from that standpoint, in trying to make it better, there's, there's a sense you can do too much editing, you can do too much refining, too much trying to make it absolutely perfect, and, and it ends up becoming more flawed than you realized. No, I, I like that point, the, that, that uh, perfect is the enemy of good. And I think, you know, and maybe we used to have this polishing the cannonball expression, you know, how long can you polish something? How shiny does it need to be? And at some point you do reach diminishing marginal returns, and I think we're aware of that. And now that we write four series simultaneously, it's more important <laughs> to us than ever that we're not wasting time. But I think, you know, one of the things that maybe occurred to us that, and I, I haven't really heard other authors talk about this, so maybe this is unique to us, or maybe it's not, maybe, maybe everybody does it, we just don't know. But I think you avoid that slump um, by realizing that the characters' lives matter to them, right? So like John Dempsey's never going to get sick of his life because it's his life. So whatever the next challenge is that's thrown at him or whatever happens to his teammates, it's going to matter to him. And so you think about your own military career as you advance and you change commands or you change missions, you know, each new command, each new mission, each new opportunity is stressful and there's an opportunity for failure. There's an opportunity for success. There's new people coming into your life, other people you have to say goodbye to. And so by modeling our series based on real life, it's not boring for us, number one. 
And number two, the characters care about what's going to happen to them. So that's how we've achieved that goal saying, hey, you know, book two is not just us recycling what we did in book one in a slightly different way so that it pleases people. It's what happens next in the characters' lives. And they have stakes in their own lives. And so you feel that when you read it. And you that's why what's really, really cool, really rewarding for us is we'll see reviews from readers and you can see a couple weeks go by and they've read the next book. And then their name shows up again. They've read the third book, then the fourth book, then the fifth book, then the sixth book. Then we get an email, when's book seven coming out? Like, I need to know what happens to these people. You know, and that means we're doing our job and that makes my day when that happens. Uh, how do you guys know when a series is over? Like, again, as you said, you keep people keep requesting more and more. Um, there is always a sense that you did one too many, right? Like there, there is always a sense where that you, you ever watch those cooking shows, you know, they try to do one more little tweak to make their dish super right. special. And at the end of the day, it's what gets them kicked off the show when all you had to do was just keep it simple, stupid. Uh, and, and that was enough to get you on to the next round. So how do you know when a series is over? And you, and you want to end on a high note, right? Nobody yep. wants to, nobody wants to go out because that last book sucked. And so, uh, and we haven't, we haven't, uh, to be honest, ended a series yet. So we're not really sure. I think that, <laughs> I think that the way, you know, to do it is exactly what Brian is saying. When you feel like the story is just told, don't try to force another book out of it because you got another house payment to make. Uh, and that's the advantage we have being able to you know, there's a lot of writers that get trapped into a series. You know, I think of uh, I think of brave people who have uh, avoided that, like Andy Gross, Andrew Gross, who was writing these great series. And they were it was sort of that formulatic series. I think how many did he have, Brian? He must have had a dozen out. And he had he had this idea that he wanted to write this World War II historical thriller. And his agent said, oh, God, no, please don't do that. And his brothers was like, no, 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 don't do that. Do do the formula, do the thing. We're making money. And he said, no, this story interests me. I'm going to go write it. And it became a New York Times bestseller. So thank goodness that he did it. But a lot of writers are afraid to do that. Um, and Brian and I are lucky that early in our career, we've already diversified. Like he was saying, we've, you know, we've got four series now that we're writing. And so we never feel stale. So hopefully the books won't get stale. Tier one, people are we're getting hate mail about we would want the next book. And so it's coming out next year. Sons of Valor is new and exciting. So we've got that. Now we have this Shepherd series with Tyndale House, which is completely different. And, uh, you know, still got the Andrews and Wilson stuff in there, but it's got a whole new element. And now we get to write the Webb Griffin stuff for Putnam. So that keeps us fresh is having a lot of diversified stories. Yeah, but, uh, I'm sorry to cut you off. I'm, I'm, I mean, I can't finish a thought without, you know, changing topics. Like, how are you writing so many different things at the same time? That's not confusing. It goes back to these characters. They're, they're like real people. So just like you wouldn't mix up your friends, you know, or people that you work with. Not, sometimes you know. I'd love to do that. I'd yeah. Love to <laughs> them in and out. Like, that'd be great. <laughs> write Mike out of the scene. <laughs> yes, I'd like to write you out of being a coworker. Please, you're fired. I don't have the ability, but it'd be great. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, for us, these people are, are it's, it would be impossible to confuse Chunk and Dempsey because they're like uh, guys that we know, you know, so it'd be very, very difficult for us to sort of mix up uh, their personalities because they're very distinct in our minds. And I think part of that, because there's two of us, you know, we talk about these characters all the time and it's like we both know them. So we have different perspectives on them, you know, and that's that's kind of weird and creepy too that like you know there's these fake humans that you know are sort of the product of two minds you know Jeff's perception of how they think and my perception of how they think and when you merge them together you get one fake human you know <laughs> it's, kind of, it's kind of strange but um it keeps them very very original I would say you know because it's not just 50 characters that Brian thought of they're not all talking like Brian and acting like Brian and they're not all talking like Jeff and acting like Jeff, they're really the product of, of our two personalities and our two experiences. So as you continue to go through these series, I mean, how do you kind of know what's next? I mean, how long can they go on for? Do you guys have a desire to do something different? Do you, do you start another series while you're in the process of all this stuff? I mean, there's still a lot of things up in the air, I guess. Yeah. 
So sort of yes to everything you just said. We do a little bit of all of that. Um, you know, the because we tell longitudinal stories across books, that makes keeping the storyline in an individual series sort of a little more kinetic and interesting and exciting. Um, and when that story is told, I think we'll know. Uh, we haven't hit that point yet. I guess the first one would be with tier one. We're about to about to finish writing book seven. So um, that that's one element. But then the other things you said are also true. We are writing and developing other series simultaneously, which is good for a creative schizophrenic like we are, because you've got somewhere else to put some of that creative energy into. And the, and the series, like we have a techno thriller series coming out in 2023. That's a whole different space and different kinds of characters. And it's not really a military thriller. It's more, uh, it's, it's different. And so we're able to get that developing. And sometimes those things will give you a fresh idea that you could use in the different series. Like, oh yeah, yeah, that made me think of this. It wouldn't work here, but you know what? That'd be great for a chunk could do that. Um, so there is a little bit of crossover in the creative seeding of it, but we do all of that. Everything that you just said, we're, we're moving different series. We're creating new things. Uh, we just uh, signed a deal on an option on a television show for the uh, new series, the Shepherd series, which we're super excited about. So that's going to be a whole new creative process for us. Oh. So I think that's how you do it is you just keep yourself stimulated like anything else. You keep yourself interested by growing Growing yourself as a writer, letting the stories that you've written, let them grow, let those characters grow and change, allow them to change. And then it doesn't get stale. I think that that's said, uh, you've known me for an hour. Uh, which character am I playing in your television series? I think he might be. Let's see. He could be. He couldn't be. Elon. These are dashing good looks. Don't don't down, don't downplay that now. He could. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, table this. Yeah, I, I think he could be Grayson, right? He's a shooter. I was thinking of I was thinking of Grayson. Maybe he could even pull off Jed. I don't know. Yeah, no, you could pull off Jed. All right, now I'm going to read. I'm going to read everything to find out how much I'm like Grayson and Jed. Hey, how how much we just insulted you, or, or exactly. if we did. <laughs> Jed's the lead, so oh, yeah, you, well, gotta, yeah, you know. I mean, yeah. the only other question is who's my leading lady playing across from me, and if. You know, I had a couple of uh, choices there. I throw you a couple of names, but yeah, that'll be a much more television oriented discussion. So uh, regardless, <laughs> yes. I kid. Um, no, but I, I mean, I, I think it's great that you guys have this relationship, but come on, there has to have been some sort of disagreement somewhere along the way. It couldn't have all been sunshine and rainbows. I mean, the only thing that ever was the question was like, like we said at the beginning, you have to at some point decide if you're going to go all in or not. There's very few people that can jump into this business um, and make a living from day one. So, you know, we both had our, our day jobs, you know, and we had to decide at some point, hey, are we willing to sort of bet the farm and both go all in? So that was something that we had to be honest with each other and say, are you ready to do this? And we took our time and we talked about it and we developed a roadmap and, and we both went all in. But, you know, if Jeff hadn't been willing to go all in or vice versa, we probably wouldn't be having this conversation because that was a big step for us. And that's when we branched out from doing one series to multiple series. Yeah. You know, everyone thinks we make it up when we do these interviews, we're always asked, you know, what about when you disagree? What about when you have a fight or whatever? And I, I, I can honestly tell you, it's just not really happened. It's not that we haven't disagreed, but you know, that mission before self and that level of trust that you develop, um, that sort of diffuses those disagreements because, mm -hmm. you know, if, if I'm like, let's go in this direction and Brian's like, let's go in this direction. And I sense that he's really got a passion for it. I trust him enough to say, you know what, if you feel that strongly about it, let's give it a try. The other thing is the, the business we're in, if it doesn't work out, it's not like we can't go back and rewrite it. Right. So um, I think that's one of the ways that we avoid conflict is the trust, but also the, the willingness to say, look, doesn't look, sound right to me, but if it really does to you, let's do it and see how it turns out. And we can always change course. What's interesting is we've probably done that a dozen times over the last few years and 15 books or whatever. And I can't think of a time that one of us relented and said, okay, let's go your way and see what happens that we went and changed it back. Generally, you're like, that was right on, man. We would never have ended up in this place if we hadn't done that. So, um, that, I think that that's how you avoid conflict. We just really haven't had fights. Not about this. I mean, um, I, hate he, I hate it when he makes fun of my my the way I dress. But 
the writing oh, stuff. You know. Sometimes we fight over wine, but other than that. Yeah, because you have terrible taste in wine. Right. There you go. Okay, there are worse things to fight over. Uh, if you I, I do want to... I do want to riff off one thing that Jeff said, though, because I think it, it's important just no matter what business you're in. And it's something that we all sort of get trapped in this paradigm. And we had a, we were laughing and laughing about it on one book because we had written something that, you know, we said very early on such and such had to happen. And so it was we were making forcing ourselves to steer the plot to accommodate this one decision we had made very early in the book. And we're, we're going through all these permutations and gyrations, trying to figure out how do we make this work? How do we stick this? And, and then we started laughing and realized, wait a minute, we wrote it, we can change it. And I think we get so stuck in this sunk cost mentality or, well, I decided to do X, Y, Z. So I have to, that's the, that's yep. the path. You know, I, I went right, right at the fork in the road. I'm stuck going right. And it's very empowering if you can say, you know what? I don't have to go around. I can do a U-turn. I can go around, go back, you know. Oh, so, you know, it takes me 30 minutes to do the U-turn, drive around and go ahead. That's a lot better than continuing down the path that you pretty sure is wrong and trying to figure out later how to get back onto the right course. So, you know, that's a lesson that I think has taken me uh, far too many years to learn, which is that, hey, if you mess up or you don't like the decision, very, very rarely is it written in stone and you're stuck with it for the rest of your life. You can always just say, you know what? Sunk cost, forget about it. Let's do it. Let's do it the right way. To that end, uh, has there been anything you have written that has gone to print um, that you that you didn't realize missed the mark and, and or until after you read it again or it went, you know, you were already done, you realized it missed the mark or it just didn't, end up the way you thought it was going to be did anything fall flat well not yet but now that you've said that you've <laughs> literally condemned us to that happening sometime in the next 12 thanks, months mark. so thanks for that mark that was, yeah, that was awesome. you know johnny rain cloud that's me um no but i mean it's is there anything that you 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 thought was going to resonate with readers and it didn't or anything like that well i have a personal experience one of one of the solo books that i wrote it was a science fiction book, but there's an element talking about, um, you know, climate change and the sixth extinction. And I mean, it's become so politically divisive right now, um, you know, that you have to be careful as an author. You, there's things that you want to talk about um, and include in the stories, but you have to be aware that, you know, especially over the past five years, you know, people have a lot of triggers now so uh, you know you, you can say something you're going to get some readers that are going to be very upset because you're challenging whatever their preconceived notions are you know i think lately what's happened in america is a lot of people have liked to sort of immerse themselves in the echo chamber of their own beliefs or you know news or social media that sort of confirms what they already think or things that they know and so if you are exposed to information that doesn't quite fit that picture, you know, the response now is to get out and attack that, you know, different opinion. And so as an author, you know, that's something that we deal with. You're going to get reviews of people that say, I was a big fan of yours, but now I hate you because you, you talked about X, Y, Z. And I think it's important as authors, you know, first of all, you know, we're expressing food for thought. I mean, I think every story is not us preaching to our readers. It's us showing them that, hey, these characters are facing different stressors and situations in their lives. And this is all food for thought for you to think about. You know, we're challenging our readers to think about uh, their preconceived ideas and their opinions on the world. We're not telling you to change them. And so it is a, it's a tougher landscape, I think, to navigate maybe than it was uh, 10 years ago in our business. Yeah, and it's weird too, isn't it? Like as you're reading, and it doesn't happen to us that often. That I remember that in uh, when you when Reset came out, that there was just it was only a couple of people. Yeah, but it really chapped Brian's ass. Like he was like, and I remember thinking because I and I wasn't involved in the book, so maybe I could be a little more objective. But I remember thinking, like they know it's a book, right? Like did did they think that you were like writing a thesis? Like it's a novel, like they know you made it up, right? Like the whole story is made up. Like you don't have to, it's not a 
political thing. You know, I remember when tier one came out, we got a handful of uh, things. There's like, oh, you guys are anti-Muslim because all your bad guys are, are Muslim. It's like, well, they're jihadi terrorists in our story. So yeah, they are like, but I just, I find that so fascinating. It's an interesting point Brian makes about how, how just on fire people are within their own political or whatever it is, social, whatever their issue is, whatever their issue is that day, you put some completely made up fictional thing in a book and it can make people go insane. It's like crazy. And I just always sit back and laugh. It's like, it's just made up guys. Like it's just a story. And I'm not even saying I think that all I can tell you is that's what Dempsey thought. Like I didn't, you know, right. <laughs> Yeah, with the reset example, you know, I had one one reviewer who said, you know, this author condones mass genocide. <laughs> no, no, that's the villain. That's the villain in the story, not not the author. Oh, <laughs> let's let's separate the author from the characters. Oh my god, you can't write anything now without it uh, being translated right. to some sort of a uh, wild opinion on social media. Um, so how much to that end? How much of you guys are in what you write or is it you totally separate yourselves from the characters? Well, I don't think you can separate them. They, you get so intimate with the characters. And, but I think that when we, when we generate the characters, I can, I can honestly say I've never really felt like I was putting me or Brian into a character, but I do think the characters are sort of amalgams of many people we've known and many mm -hmm. people we've served with. Like how many, how many stories do you have from being downrange, just stupid stuff that, you know, makes you laugh or makes you think about a certain dude or someone that you knew? If you could take that element and then an element from this other part of your life and you could put those all into a story with a character, I think that's how it occurs. So I don't really feel like I project myself into the characters, or at least I try not to do that. But I think Brian and I sort of take people from our lives and from our experiences and the characters become very real for us because we put elements of real people that we've known and served with into them. So I think it's more that than, than us. You agree with that, Brian, or, or is yeah. your character, or it's all you, is it all you? No, I, I definitely agree. And I think, you know, there are some characters who are, who are named after real people that, that we know. And, um, you know, so certain mannerisms or, you know, quirks of their personality find the way into the stories they're always with permission. We ask people if they want to be a character in, in, in the series. Um, but it's fun, right? But th they're, they're also different people than their, their doppelgangers, right? Because they're put in this fictional universe. But I think that that richness, especially those things that you admire about people or those elements of people's personality that challenge your own perceptions or make you say, hmm, like, I wouldn't have I wouldn't have looked at it that way, or I wouldn't have, that wouldn't have been the thought that came to my head. That helps us create very rich characters because like I said earlier in the interview, you know, we don't want them to just be 50 shades of Brian or 50 shades of, of Jeff. They have to be distinct from us. You know, I, I'll write a, in dialogue, sometimes I'll write something, I'll say, well, that's what I would have said. And I'll delete it and say, that's now, now let's write something that I wouldn't have said, you know? Right. Well, uh, write me in as the most polarizing figure you can think of. So uh, the next character that emulates me will be uh, polarizing, to say the least. We're, 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 way, we're way ahead of you. I've been, <laughs> I've, been, I've been writing that dude for this whole hour. <laughs> good, good. Glad to, glad to know that I could be the inspiration for something useful in life, as uh, I, I have often fallen short on inspiring anyone to do anything these days. All right, gentlemen. Uh, look, it, it's, it's amazing what you guys have created. Uh, it is, certainly is impressive. Uh, when you look at the resume of books that you guys have put together, again, the tier one book series, Sons of Valor, uh, of course, as you mentioned, the Shepherd series, um, the Presidential Agent series. I mean, just the, the works and, and the, the novels just keep on coming. Uh, they're incredibly popular. Uh, you know, I, I assume everybody can get them everywhere they can get books online, say, the, the, the normal places. Yep, everywhere books are sold. The easiest thing to do to just keep track of it is just go to our website, andrews-wilson.com. Um, every book is listed there and we even, uh, uh, because we're so generous, we even have little links to your favorite booksellers. So each one will have, it'll have Barnes and it'll have Amazon and have a lot of independent booksellers because we're big supporters of indie bookstores. And so, uh, it's easiest to keep track of what's coming next. Cause there's so many going on to just follow us on the website or even sign up for the newsletter. When you come there, there's some free stuff that those people get and uh, early notification that they get. Brian actually worked really hard on this website that's really interactive now. 
there's opportunities for fans to interact with us and post pictures and that sort of thing. So that's the easiest thing. Andrews-Wilson.com. You can get anywhere you need to be. Well, and of course, again, we'll link all of uh, the, the books that you guys have or directly to your website on hazardground.com. So people can find it there as well. But again, I appreciate the, the story, gentlemen. I mean, clearly, uh, storytellers yourselves, it's been a lot of fun speaking with you both. And certainly it's been uh, a great journey to hear how you guys got from where you were to where you are and all the success in between. So we certainly appreciate you guys uh, spending some time with us. It's a great time, man. Thank you so much for having us. Really good. Yes, thanks for having us on. And and uh, be sure to subscribe and follow Hazard Ground. No, thank you very much for the plug. Brian Andrews, Jeffrey Wilson, thank you for being part of the Hazard Ground. Thanks. You've been listening to Kill Cliff's Hazard Ground podcast, hosted by Mark Zeno. If you have an interesting story to tell and you'd like to be on the show, send us an email at producer at hazardground.com. And if you like the show, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review on Apple Podcasts. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.